thank God that we're always in his hands. I thought for a minute there that Pastor Regina might just go ahead and preach and relieve me today of having to do that. Amen. That was a good word. I would have been all right with that, I think. That was a good word this morning. Amen. He is a way maker. Amen. At times when we don't know what God's going to do, we need him to do something. He is a way maker. Amen. The Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And like rivers of water, he turns it whichever way he chooses. Amen. So God touched that man's heart to ensure that you were provided for and that you would have a job. Amen. I love the fact that God loves us so much that he always provides for us. We never have to worry about whether he's forgotten us, but he always provides. And really goes above and beyond. Amen. You probably didn't expect, amen, that kind of reception, but God always exceeds our expectations. Amen. Good to see y'all this morning. Y'all glad to be in God's house today? Amen. It's good to be in his house. One more time. Amen. Good to be saved and to be born again, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't know if people feel, are y'all filled with the Holy Ghost this morning? Amen. Some of y'all are. Amen. That's all right. Amen. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I love Jesus this morning. And I, I, I love, you know, you, you need the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you want to live holy today. And I thought I might get a little few more. I'm in a Pentecostal church, huh? We believe in the gifts and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, don't we? Amen. If you want to live holy today, especially today, you need the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Pastor Lisa, we might need to have a sermon on just being baptized with the Holy Ghost and just lay hands on the folks this morning. Amen. You need the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. You can't just will yourself into doing good. But you need the presence of the Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, to rest upon you. Amen. Well, I won't preach on that today, but... There is a word from the Lord. I just want to acknowledge all of our men this morning who were here for our men's prayer breakfast yesterday. We had an awesome time. There were 30 or so men here at time of fellowship. It was an awesome time of fellowship in the word. Uh, Minister Darren, who led that and coordinated it. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise for his efforts. We thank God for them. All of our men that assisted. Amen. We had we had some men doing praise and worship. Amen. We had Elder Mark and Elder Dave doing praise and worship. All right. They did praise and worship for us. Amen. We had Reverend Ricky, our director of administration, with his apron on in the back cooking. Amen. I mean, we were all the way live yesterday. Amen. Praise God. We thank God. It was an awesome time, and I was just so proud and so thankful to be able to fellowship with the brothers. Amen. I want to put you on notice that for our senior adults, our frontliners, we call our frontliners, our frontliner ministry, we're going to be having a service just to celebrate you. Anybody in the house this morning that's 60 years or older, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Amen. Amen. I see you. We're going to have a service to celebrate you. The fourth Sunday this month, November 24th, and my spiritual papa, Bishop Jimmy Campbell and Reverend Mary Louise Campbell, going to be here to preach. Amen. Amen. So we look forward to them coming. I look forward to you being here. We're going to celebrate you. That's that's the man that birthed me in ministry, and I'm always excited to just be around him, like, even if he's not preaching. But he's going to be here, and he's going to preach the word. Amen. How many of y'all know Bishop Campbell? Amen. You know Bishop Campbell? Amen. So I expect you to be in church that Sunday morning. <laughs> Uh -huh, set you up. I expect you to have your hips right in that seat you're in right now. Amen. November the 24th at 10 o'clock a.m. Amen. To be in the house of the Lord. We want to celebrate you. That's normally our youth uh, emphasis Sunday, but we want to have our other youth celebrated that day, if that's all right. Our other young people, our senior adults, we want to celebrate them that day. The calendar gets so packed sometimes it's hard to find spaces, but I'm looking forward to that. Amen. The word of the Lord this morning is from the book of Luke chapter 7. Verse 36 through 50, I'll ask you to turn there. For our very special guest who's with us for the second time today, we thank you for being with us today. God bless you this morning. Amen. Turn to the book of Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 36. Amen. You could signify by standing when you get there. Amen. 6 o'clock tonight, we're having worship and the word. I want to see you in the house. Reverend Clarice Moyer, who is an ordained minister, in the church of God, she'll be here to preach the gospel. You used to hear her sing, but she's also a preacher. So she's going to preach the gospel tonight. So 
So I want you to be here at 6. Our service is literally from 6 to 7. 6 to 7. So that's not a whole lot to ask. Come out and fellowship. I believe God has a word for you. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through verse 50. Are you there? It says, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at the, sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Now, I just want to tell you, this is not the same woman who was Mary of Bethany that we read about who broke her alabaster flask and poured it on Jesus' feet. This is a different woman. Verse 38 says, And she stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them from, with her hair, with the hair of her head. Then she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisees had invited him, who invited him, saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, you with me? He talked to himself. If he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him. I found somewhere else in Scripture where a woman touched him and was made whole. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now Simon is thinking on the inside, Jesus is talking verbally. He says, I, I want to say something to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two, debtor, two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, Simon, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who gave, who was, who was forgave more. He said to him, you have rightly judged. We're almost there. You with me? Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. Now, notice what's happening there. He's, who is he looking at? He's looking at Simon. And he's, he says... Let, let, let's, let's, let's go back for y'all want to argue with me <laughs> Simon answered and said I suppose the one who gave more so the Bible says Jesus answered and said Simon I have something to say to you so let's skip forward verse 45 he's talking he says you gave me no kiss who's he talking to but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet when I came in he's talking to who but he's looking at who? Verse 46. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, who is he talking to? Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the sum loves little. Simon He's talking to Simon, but looking at her. Then he said to her, now he's talking to her, your sins are forgiven you. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? He's sitting at a table. He's talking to Simon while he's looking at the woman. He forgives her while he's talking to Simon. Then he looks at her and forgives her. He's at a table with her. Reminds me of scripture where he says, thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I want to share with you this morning, and I stopped there to help you understand the nuance of what's going on in this passage of scripture so that you can understand and know that while the devil is trying to buffet you and accuse you, God is able to bless you in the presence of your trouble. 
And I want to share with you this morning a message called Flawed But Forgiven. Amen. Flawed But Forgiven. How many would acknowledge this morning that you have some flaws? But at the same time, you thank God that you are forgiven. Amen. Hallelujah. Take your seat. While you're taking your seat, look at somebody and say, I'm flawed, but I'm forgiven. You see my flaws, but my Father has forgiven me. Amen. Thank God. Simon was looking at this lady and wondering why this flawed person had the right to touch and be in the presence of an, a, a, a perfect God. God began, Jesus began to talk to Simon and he began to tell her, tell Simon in what I believe is a paraphrase, she's flawed, but she is forgiven. See, most people, I've shared this analogy with you, but I think it is appropriate for this morning. Most people don't really like dirt. Amen. Raise your hand if you like dirt. Don't raise your hand because I'm going to think something's wrong. Most people really don't like dirt. They don't like to, unless you're a kid, you don't like to get around and lay in the dirt and play in the dirt. You really have no use for dirt. Um, but how many people in here enjoy artwork? Yeah, yeah. Raise your hand. Amen. You enjoy artwork. Well, there's, there's this trend that started, uh, and it's called dirty art. You ever heard of it? It's called dirty art. And uh, it's, it's where creatively minded people use trash, discarded items to create beautiful pieces of art. Go look it up when you get home. It is a real thing. They use discarded pieces of trash and they create beautiful artwork out of it. And in fact, the movement has gone beyond using the dirty items to create sculptures to the point of literally creating homes for people to live into. And offices and building structures, all, structures, all taken from discarded trash. This, this dirt, or this, this trash, is, is useless material and it's been taken from places where you might expect to find things that nobody wants. Useless stuff, a place where people would never go to search for anything that could be used of any value. Some say some have taken have been taken from the parks in New York City. They go there and they find this trash, and others have gone to the Great Great Wall of China and found trash. And it's been said that some of this artwork actually is generational. It actually transcends generations and cultures and nationalities. It's this unique phenomenon called dirty art. Essentially, these creatively minded people have taken time to locate useful items among them which have been thrown away and rendered trash. To be more direct, they create, to create dirty art, uh, art they look among the trash heap, they go to the dump, to the places where we don't like to go, and they find items and they create something beautiful out of it. It's amazing to me to see the process of how something that is so flawed and has such little value can be re rendered useless by some and valued by others. We've heard the saying that a one man's trash is another man's treasure. Well, I would submit to you today that dirty art, this phenomenon, did not really start with a group of creatively minded environmentalists who brilliantly found a way to make good use of useless stuff. But I would submit to you that dirty art literally started 2,000 years ago when the second person of the Trinity, whom we call Jesus the Christ, uh, came and, and laid aside his royal position in heaven and came to rescue what had been discarded. Anybody in this house know what I'm talking about? He came to this earth in the form of a man and living a human life and dying a human death, 
so that we might be useful to his kingdom. He came to a flawed earth through the womb of a flawed woman. He, he had flawed a flawed birthing bed, something they called a stable and a trough, a feeding trough. He grew up among flawed people and lived in a flawed world. He was crucified using flawed wood that he had created it. And people crucified him with flawed, flawed reasoning. And he gave up the ghost on those pieces of wood and went to a flawed tomb. But after he was laid to rest, they began a process of transformation of what was flawed into something that was beautiful. And after three days, the one who had come and lived in a flawed world among flawed people rose without one flaw and with all power in his hands and had now created a path for what was once filthy and flawed to be used for his glory. In layman terms, saints, I'll bring it home for you. We were flawed at our core and with little to offer because of the original sin of Adam. But Jesus took what was useless and made a way for us to be reconciled and brought back to him that we might be useful for the kingdom. I'm flawed this morning, but thank God I am forgiven. I'm reminded of the words of E.M. Bartlett, Bartlett that said, I, I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. He goes on to say, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I came to remind somebody this morning. I know I ain't supposed to be preaching yet because I'm still beginning, but I came to remind somebody this morning that you may smell good, you may look good, you might see good and sound good, but you are flawed at your core and you needed a savior who would find you when other people didn't like you and people can't put up with you. You had a savior who said, I love you in spite of your faults. While you may have been flawed, he remained faithful. You were flawed, but you were never forsaken. You were flawed, but you were fit for his kingdom. You were flawed, and now he says that you are forgiven. Somebody ought to thank God today that he does not judge you according to the flesh and according to your failures. If the truth be told, some of y'all went to bed last night having committed some stuff you shouldn't have committed, but God woke you up today in his faithfulness and said, I see beyond your fault and beyond your flaws, and I made you fit for my kingdom. I'm so thankful for grace this morning. I, I can preach grace every Sunday. I'm so thankful for grace. If you had caught me 20 years ago in the midst of sin, you would say this man is never worthy to preach the gospel or to be called a child of the living God. That was some acts that if God had caught me in the middle of that and decided he wanted to come back to this earth while I was in the middle of sin, I would have bust tail wide open. But grace said, I love you enough to see beyond today and what you're doing right now to see what you're going to be and who I called you to be and the potential of what you can be that while you have flaws you are forgiven oh yes 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 I see people that I used to run the streets with. I see people that I used to do stuff with that I shouldn't do, and they're still living the same way. And I just walk past and say, there's nothing in me that's allowed me to be who I am. It's grace that's covering me and walking with me that's keeping me. Because the truth be told, I'm still flawed, but I'm forgiven this morning. Just because you saved, 
don't mean you don't have flaws. Just because you speak in tongues don't mean you don't have flaws. Just because you can quote scripture don't mean you don't have flaws. We all are imperfect and in deep need of his salvation. We all need his grace. And I thank God that when I go to bed with an attitude, he don't let me die in the midst of my mess. And I wake up the next morning and grace is there to escort me through my day and say, you flaw, but you are forgiven. But what I think of the goodness of Jesus. Some of y'all have already forgotten what it took to find in your mess. Some of y'all were hormones, alcoholics, drug addicts, prostitutes. Say, I've never been on the street. I've never been a prostitute. Well, some of y'all were liars, and you can lie real good. Some of y'all did everything you can think to do, but he loved you enough to rescue you out of your sin say that a while you may look bad I've got grace to cover you that's why I praise him when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me my soul cries out hallelujah thank God for saving me I just told you the song says he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love. Now some of y'all wouldn't have spent a cent on me, not a red cent, but he spilled his blood just for me so that I can live and have life. Y'all sit down, y'all ain't ready for me to preach yet. Y'all are ready for me to preach yeah? I'm going to follow it back so you can catch up. Every once in a while, he just shows me where I came from. Not that I've already attained or I've already apprehended, but there's one thing I do. Get those things to watch out behind and we're reaching towards those things to watch out ahead. I press for the mark of the prize of the high call in Christ Jesus. I was one of those trash heaps thrown away by society. People said he's nothing but a whoremonger is not worthy to be called God's child. But he found me in the trash heap. He said, I've got something beautiful that I can think out of you. That's why I love him so much. Because he loves me beyond my faults and he sees my needs. You are flawed this morning, but you are forgiven. God created a beautiful artwork. And grace recognizes that in your flesh, you still have imperfections. But grace says, despite your imperfections, I've made you kingdom qualified. Oh, that's good news. I've made you kingdom qualified. What qualifies you to do what you do? Grace. What qualifies you to have the job you have? Grace. What qualifies somebody to come ask somebody who wasn't really qualified? Grace. What qualifies you to be blessed even though you don't deserve to be blessed? What qualifies your bills to be paid even though you mishandled your money? What qualifies
qualifies you to stay in your house even when the banker said, I'm coming to take your house from you? What qualifies you to drive a car that the devil has decided he wants to destroy by an accident grace? It's only the grace of God that qualifies you for anything that you have. So God sent me by this morning, the church, to remind every one of you that God is not frustrated by your flaws. He's not frustrated by your imperfections. You may be flawed, but if you know Jesus, you're at the same time forgiven. You see, it's confusing to the human intellect that you could be flawed while simultaneously be forgiven. It's confusing to understand that we live in a fleshly body that's flawed, but we have a perfect spirit that lives in us that says you're forgiven. God says it's simply up to you as to which one you choose to listen to. If you understand the spirit of God is living in you, your flaws don't have to take control of you. But the spirit of God that lives in you, you bring your flaws under subjection and you make your body a living sacrifice unto God. And when you give God all of your brokenness in life and all of your imperfections, he will assume the role of the sovereign artist. He will take your mess and create what we know as dirty art. Yeah. Now, the thing about this is that it doesn't make sense to other people. If you were to see real dirty art, you would not know where that art came from. Yeah. How many thank God that he knows how to fix you up and clean you up so that people, if they looked at you today, they'd never, ever know where you came from? Yeah. If, if, if you knew really what I really looked like at my core, you would not think I am who I am today. I thank God that he didn't cause us to walk around with that on our chest to say, just remember that this is you. But he cleans you up and gives you the ability to walk with his spirit so that when people look at you, they don't even know where you came from. What if you look like where you came from? Some of y'all would have to walk around today with some jail bars with you. What if you look like where you came from? Some of y'all would have to carry a crack rock with you in your pocket just to remind you where you came from. What if you look like where you came from? Some of y'all would be in the hospital bed when Jesus lifted you up from healing your body. What if you look like where you came from today? You don't look like where you came from because grace said, I'm covering you from what you used to be. Some of y'all would have to walk around with a big L on your forehead. Liar, loser, lush, everything you can think of. If you had to look like where you came from. Thank God I don't look like where I came from. He brought me from a mighty long way. Songwriter said, something beautiful. Something good. All of my confusion. He understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of my life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I take you to the text this morning. Jesus is having dinner at the house of a Pharisee. If you don't pay attention as you read this text, you can miss the nuance of what's actually happening here. Verse 37 says, there's a woman who lived there in sin. From reading this, we can surmise, although scripture doesn't tell us, that she was likely a prostitute. We learn that Jesus was at the Pharisee's house eating dinner when this woman comes in and brings an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him weeping, she began to wet his feet with her pain, her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, and the Bible says she poured perfume on them. It's important to know that in those times, the custom was that when you went to someone's house to eat, it was automatic that the servants of the house would wash your feet. It was a custom of saying, I want you to understand I want you to be at home here, and I want you to be comfortable. They wore open toe shoes, and it was a dirty terrain. And so when they went places, one of the ways they would freshen up is washing their hands and washing their feet. Yeah. 
and the servants of the house would wash their feet for them. Well, in this story, we find that Jesus is eating at the house of a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a religious leader at the time who knew or should have known all of what Scripture says and how we are to treat people. The Bible says that when Jesus goes to this Pharisee's house, that the Pharisee did not even offer the courtesy of one of his own servants washing the feet of Jesus. It was this raggedy woman who was known as a sinner who made her way to the house to find Jesus and to wash his feet. It's interesting to me that this holy spiritual man who understand the Levitical law and understood custom was so enamored with Jesus being different that he forgot his man. Jesus is in his house and it takes somebody from the outside to come and do what someone on the inside should have done for him. This woman moseys her way up there and she makes a statement not just to Jesus but to everybody in the house. First she comes and she presents herself at the house. We have no indication that she was already there. But then her humility causes her to take the form of a servant. She then uses not the Pharisees water or towels. She didn't say can I use your towels? Can I use your water? But she begins to minister to Jesus out of the literal essence of her pain. Yes, that was the Bible says she begins to weep with tears because she knew what the Pharisee felt he had to say. She knew that she was a wretched sinner and that she was in need of salvation. And she demonstrates it by her pain and her hurt while the Pharisee feels the need to say, you don't know who's touching you. I love the fact that Jesus has great experience with people touching him. The Bible tells us a woman with the issue of blood touched him while there was a crowd around him. And there was no way to know that somebody had touched him specifically. But when she touches him with a certain touch, he says, who touched me? All of the holy people were surrounding and thronging him, touching him with their holiness, tongue-talking selves. Yet a woman who is broken and flawed finds her way through the crowd of holy people, touches just the bottom piece of his garment, and he has the audacity to say, who touched me? I would submit to you that the real question is not who touched me, but what touched me? It was the brokenness of a woman who was flawed and knew her flaws that touched him. It was the brokenness of humanity that he had literally come to this earth for that literally met him that day and touched him. And so he wasn't uh, 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 esteeming highly the people who were standing close to him and pressing against him, but it was some flawed person who made their way and said, if I can just only touch a small piece of him. This woman comes into Simon's house and she has the same spirit and same mentality. Simon looks and says, what is this woman doing washing his feet with her tears? If he knew who had touched him, he would never let her touch him. She didn't have to do this, but her sorrow her understanding of her wretchedness forced her to a place where she served her Savior with her tears. What happens next is interesting. Verse 39, the Pharisees, the Pharisee began to have this opinion about what he seen. Can I tell you, saints of God, that people will always have an opinion. They always will have their own thought about it. They always will have their own points about it. And they'll be quick to point out your flaws. People will be quick to point out your weaknesses. And everything that doesn't measure up to their standard. Pharisee said, this woman, you don't know who she is. Why are you letting her touch you? People will define you if you allow them to. 
by your flaws, by your imperfections. This woman had the, the gumption to say, I am fully assured and well aware of where I failed. That's one of the challenges with the church today. We don't have enough people in the body of Christ who understand their failures. She said, I'm well aware of where I'm failing. That's why I'm here. The Pharisee is sitting there not even acknowledge, acknowledging the fact you've got the Savior sitting at your table and you don't even have enough capacity to wash his feet. The Pharisee saw only the flaws and said her reputation renders her unqualified to offer you anything let alone touch you. He says, if you knew who was touching you. The beautiful thing is, he knew exactly who was touching him. Yeah, right, 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 right. Right. Aren't you glad that he sees a different picture? Yes. 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 Others may call you messy, mm -hmm. but Jesus sees the potential for a masterpiece. Verse 40, we read here, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to ask you. He said, teacher, ask it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me which one will love him more. Simon answered, says, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said, you have rightly judged. You know what I've learned is that sometimes those with the greatest imperfections have the greatest heart for Jesus. Amen. Sometimes when, when, you, when you are a person and you know your limitations, you know your flaws, that gives your heart that pursues after God. I, I've literally sat in services at times with preachers even and sat there beside them looking while the preacher was preaching and seeing them saying, yeah, you ain't start preaching good enough yet for me to shout. And I'm thinking to myself, do you understand where you came from? Do, do you understand what it took God in order to save you? Do, do you want to, you're so dignified in your ability to be a great orator that somebody's got to say something that tickles you a certain way before you can uh, stand up and say amen. But but when, when, when I think about how good God is for me, I really don't need nobody to preach to me. I, I don't need anybody to say or, or convince me uh, that I'm not worthy of his grace but, but because I know my flaws. You don't know my flaws. You don't live with me. My wife knows my flaws. My children knows my flaws. I know my flaws but Jesus loves me in spite of my flaws and that is enough for me to understand that this grace thing is something that's too big for us to comprehend. It doesn't equate or add up that he should love me in spite of my flaws. In verse 44 through 47, Jesus begins to tell Simon, he says, this woman has offered me hospitality at a reception that you have not even offered me. I wonder how many dignified people are going to walk up to the gate and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. How many folk who know all of the churchy things to do and say, and he's going to say, I never knew you because in your heart, you did not understand who you really were and what it took for me to save you. Then Jesus teaches us a valuable principle through these woman, this woman's actions. When you realize the depth of your own sin and the greatness of God's mercy, it will compel you to love others unconditionally. We've been seeing so much in the news today and social media of how people, unfortunately, even of our own skin color, are encouraging us to return hate with hate. Encouraging us to, dis to disseminate hate in exchange for bigotry. Last time I checked, Jesus came to an entire earth that was bigoted and were bigots against him. Last time I checked, he said we're to love our enemies. Yes. And if the love of Christ has been shed abroad in your heart, I mean truly 
shed abroad in your heart, you cannot help but to love even your enemies. I know it's a little uncomfortable, and I want it to be, because God has got to get the church to the place where we stop letting the world sow seeds of hate in our heart and cause us to react like the world. You can't hate just because somebody else is hating. When has that ever been Christian? When has God ever uh, condoned us to hate because somebody else? Y'all can look at me crazy if you want to. I'm going to preach the gospel anyway. Just because somebody did something hateful to you does not give you the right or the rationale to not be hate to be hateful to them. And I'll take it even a step further and make you even more angry. You're to pray for them and to love them. And when they're hungry, you're to feed them. And when they're in need, you're to clothe them. Preach all preacher. We don't hear that anymore because we've seen so much hate in the world that we've become cold in our hearts. We don't even know if we're allowed to love because somebody is going to judge us based on our love. But the Bible says that you'll be persecuted because he was persecuted. And you will be a cup. People will come against you because people came against him. You cannot sow hate because people hate. That's why you put that in there. I promise you it's here for a reason. Because when you understand how wretched you were and the grace of God that covered you, you cannot help but to say, I don't like it, but I've got to forgive. The devil has tried to sell the church. I hear people asking Save for asking questions that I'm saying to myself, why are we asking this question? Should I pray for evil leaders? Should I, why are we even asking this? I'll tell you why we ask it. Because we don't understand grace. And we've forgotten that we're dirty art. Somebody else's dirt may look different than yours, but it's still the same dirt. Somebody else's sin may be more reprehensible in your eyes than yours, but in God's eyes, it's still the same sin. And even though you may think that I'm saved now, and I'm sanctified, and I'm Holy Ghost filled, I promise you there's some things about you that are undesirable. And if people treated you according to the way that you treated other people at times, people were walking around hating you. But God has called us to be what he says are ministers of reconciliation. I don't know where I'm going here this morning, but we're now in a society where the church has got to understand its role as ministers of reconciliation. We're not called to be people who build walls and separation. We're called to be people who reconcile those who are broken. I know it's easy to get angry when people do and say things. What if Jesus had said, all oh, y'all crazy? I changed my mind. I'm going back to heaven. We'll all be sitting here looking at each other. What are we going to do? When you realize the depth of your own sin, you can't help but to love. And if you have a hard time loving, it might be that you need to revisit your wretchedness. He said that our salvation is as filth and rags. Revisit your wretchedness if you have a hard time forgiving and loving others. Jesus was able to take a woman who was deeply flawed in sin. Deeply flawed. And because of her sorrow and repentance, he saw the beauty that, that she had to offer him. He forgave her. He, he saved her. And he sent her away restored. Saints, can I tell you this morning that no matter how deeply flawed you may be, 
you have much to offer to the kingdom. Jesus doesn't look at your human flaws and say you're useless to me. You may feel that you have little to offer because of your education or because you may not have as many resources as others. You may feel as though you're flawed because you failed in your attempts to do things in the past and you dream big and your dreams have fallen in front of you. You may feel unfulfilled in your pursuits at life as if you've been an utter failure. You've been an utter failure as a parent, as a child, as a friend. Saints, no matter how you feel this morning or how flawed you feel, God sees beyond your flaws and sees your usefulness for his kingdom. Bible tells us as I hasten my way towards the close that Mary Magdalene was a great example of one who would be who is seen today as too deeply flawed to be forgiven. I know y'all like to think of her as a prostitute, but the scripture says in Matthew 16, 9, that Jesus cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. Seven demons. Jesus could have delivered her and told her, just go be happy that my grace has covered you and that I've forgiven you and just go live a God-fearing life. Be happy, Mary. But Jesus didn't just deliver her. The Bible says that he pulled her close into his inner circle of followers. She became an integral part of his life. And he ultimately, she became historical to his mission on earth. She became a staple in Jesus' life. In fact, she's often thought of as the second most important person in the New Testament. She was present at the crucifixion. She was present at the resurrection. Her name is mentioned more times in the gospel than most of the apostles' names are mentioned. I don't think that's a coincidence that Jesus did that. She was present the morning he resurrected and was among the first to see him in a newly resurrected, glorified body. A woman who came with nothing but flaws and sinfulness and after she was touched by the master became a beautiful work of art and became impactful in the kingdom and the mission for which Jesus came. I challenge you today to recognize your worth and your value in the body. Recognize who you are. I believe there sometimes that if we understood our value and our worth to God, we might make better choices. Better choices in what we say and who we connect ourselves with, how we live. If we understood our value, we wouldn't allow people to devalue us or overlook what we have to offer. You don't have to accept any old thing from any old body. You are a king's kid. You don't have to just allow people to give you what they want to give you. You belong to the master. You don't have to just allow Satan to offer you what he decides that he, he thinks you are deserving of now. You belong to the king. You belong to the master. And if you understand your value and who you are, you won't just accept accept anything. God says you're his handiwork. He says that you're his beautiful work of art. He says you're a chosen people, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, his own special people. You're special in his eyes. You don't have to accept what the devil says to you. Amen. I want to leave you with these last thought here. If you want to continuously live a life where you're useful to the kingdom, you must first, and you can write this down if you're taking notes, always realize and recognize your limits. I think I preached about this maybe last week. But you have to recognize your limits. Sometimes, you, you know, you, you start out with a low opinion of yourself and God begins to do something great in your life. He begins to bless you and you see God open some doors and he begins to excel and accelerate you and if you're not careful you can begin to think that you've done this in your own strength. Yeah. You can begin to forget that it was only God's grace. I know nobody in this house does that but, but, but I, I believe that's why on Sunday morning sometimes Minister Terry has got to rev people up to give God glory because somebody forgot their limitations. Philippians 3, the Bible says, that Paul already quoted, he says, I don't believe I've already attained or have apprehended. I haven't already arrived, but I'm forgetting what's behind me. 
and I'm reaching towards that's what's in front of me, and I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize. Now, he is the man that wrote three quarters of the New Testament, and he has the ability to see within himself to say, I'm flawed. You have to always remember that you need God on every level. You need him to wake up. You need him to inhale and exhale. Put the left foot in front of the other. You need God on every level. Don't ever let the enemy make you forget who your God is. You need him to open doors in your life. You need him to shut the doors that you want open, that he knows you don't need open. You need him to prepare ways before you where man has, has, has closed, the, closed it in front of you. You need him to give you favor in times where man wants to, de to minimize you. You also have to recognize and recognize your limitations. It, it, it doesn't mean that you have a low opinion of yourself. It simply means you have a high opinion of God. Yeah. Recognizing that you're limited doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. It just means you think more of God. In Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says to us that God has taken the foolish things of this world, the less desirable things, to confound the wise. You say, Pastor, why are you preaching on this? If you've noticed, there's been a theme throughout my sermons the past month or two. Why are you preaching on this thing where you're telling us to think higher of ourselves? The reason is because a person who thinks lowly of themselves cannot accomplish much. But when you know who you are, whether it's hell or high water, you know who you are and the devil cannot stop you. Finally, I want to leave you with this. If you want to be useful to God and remain fit for the kingdom, you have to make up in your mind that you are never going to turn back. Yes. Amen. Now, now, the devil has been trying to get me to turn back for many years. He tried to bring everything he can to try to get us to turn back. Luke tells us, he says, and Jesus said to him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. It may get tough, but you can never look back. Preacher yesterday talked about the fact that when, when Lot and his wife left the, the evil place of Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, just keep on walking, but something in Lot's, in Lot's wife's mind told her to look back. Sometimes the devil will tell you to look back, just doubt, just wonder whether or not you can go through this. But I want to encourage you this morning that if God has had enough love for you to save you, don't you ever consider going back. You will have to, at times, carry your cross. You, at, at times, you will have to carry burdens. It's just part of living. It's just part of life. It's just part of being a Christian. It's part of being born again. You're going to have to carry burdens at times. The Bible says they even told Jesus while he was walking on his way to Golgotha, they made him carry his own cross. And when he got too heavy for him, the Bible says they sent the man that came and carried it for him. But there's going to be times in your life where you're going to want somebody to carry your cross and God's going to say, I've given you the grace to carry it. Just because your cross is heavy doesn't give you the ability or the right to turn back. What if Jesus had said, I'm reversing all of this. I'm done. Not only are you crucifying me, but you're going to make me carry my own cross. The Bible tells us that we all have to bear one of these. That's right. No matter who you are, we all have one to bear. Amen. But there's a reason Jesus got up on the third day to let you know that he has all power in his hands. Yes. And there's nothing so heavy in your life that you don't have the capacity to bear it. Yes. You can play on closing. I want to encourage someone and, and and I want to say this because I want to pray for somebody today. In 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 12, the Bible said that God had began to speak to Paul, the apostle. He gave him great revelations and visions. Paul said, so that I don't become 
elevated because of the great revelations and visions that God has given me. He, he's given me a thorn in my flesh. I believe another way of saying that is he could say he's, he's, he's given me a cross to bear. I've got to carry this thing. The Apostle Paul said three times I pray that he will remove this thorn in my flesh. You see the parallel of the cross? Three days he rose. The Bible says that God spoke to Paul and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. I want to pray for somebody this morning who's carrying their cross. You're flawed. You're forgiven. But you're carrying your cross today. You're praying and asking God to remove that thorn. God has chosen not to remove it. You've forgotten the fact that we all have a cross to bear. Maybe yours is your marriage. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe yours is your job. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's something mental or emotional. Carrying this cross shared with you some time ago, several times I think I've shared it with you, from the age of 15 years old, God illuminated for me my cross. I didn't know what God was doing, all I knew is that I was going through a hard time emotionally, psychologically. I was dealing with anxiety. Not just a little nervous, but the kind of anxiety that's debilitating. 15 years old. As I got older, I realized, I said, this is not normal. Thank God for my wife. She said, you need to go get some help. I think maybe we had been married for maybe, maybe two years at the most. 20 some years ago. Wait a minute, God, I'm I'm saved. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I love you. And I gotta deal with this. That's when God began to teach me the lesson of what it means to carry a cross around. See, I would have thought that Christianity was this thing that you just pray and you ask God to take care of it, and he moves it. I went to see somebody. Oh, I'm going to see somebody, and it's going to be all good. You know what they said, Pastor Lisa? They said, I'm going to send you not just to a counselor, but I'm going to send you to a psychiatrist. Because you need medicine. Wait a minute, I thought my cross was going to be released. It just got heavier. They put me on a medical regiment. I'm going to school, Reverend Maisie, every day teaching children who are medicated for emotional disturbance. And they don't even know that when I got up that morning, I had to take my medicine too. Carry the cross. to know there's nothing easy about this walk called Christianity but if you've committed your life to me you'll understand there's some flaws in your life there's some flaws in your flesh there's nothing perfect about you there's some things that you wish were not the way they are but you can't change that but my grace is sufficient probably two years that I got up every morning I took my medicine I know some preachers wouldn't share this I would go to work and I would hear them make jokes 
How about other people? Oh, they must have taken their medicine today. And I'm saying to myself, just 30 minutes ago, I took my A couple years passed. God delivered me. He freed me. Took me off the medicine. But every once in a while, that flaw will try to raise his head. Make me look back. Every once in a while, the devil will remind me. Remember, you still flawed. Every once in a while, I'll come home from a hard day at work. And I'll go to my wife, and I'll look in her eyes. And I say, today was a hard one. I felt anxiety today like I hadn't felt in a long time. Why? Because we're all flawed. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, She'll remind me what God did for me 20 years ago. He took me through that process. He healed me. Yeah. Why am I sharing all this? I'm sharing all this because sometimes at church, we don't like to take our face off. We don't like to disrobe our flaws in front of other people. And we sit out every Sunday and we come in flawed, we shout, we dance, we sing, and we go home. Enemy beats us about the head and shoulders with our imperfections. I'm sitting on the stoop this morning, exposing myself to you. Because I want you to know today that his grace is sufficient. If there's somebody today who deals with a thorn that you just wish God would take it. I just wish he would take it. But he hasn't moved it. You begin to judge yourself based upon your thorn. God wants you today to know you might be flawed, but you're forgiven. I wish he told me to tell everybody in this house today that in three days, he's going to take it from you. But I'm sitting because I just want to have a talk with you as I close. There's some things that might be with you until you go to glory. joy of your salvation is predicated upon your ability to get rid of your thorn. You'll never be happy. You know how hard it is to pastor sometimes? When you already have trouble with anxiety. You have to wonder if you're going to say something that's going to send somebody over the edge. You have to wonder if, did I do the right thing? Did I say the right thing? You're already dealing with your own anxiety. There's been times I've said, God, I don't want this no more. God will remind me and say, you are flawed, but you are forgiven. And you're fit for my kingdom. I'm being as raw and open this morning as I can be on purpose. Because I'm just tired of people coming to church on Sunday morning. And not being able to open. Some of, some of you all need deliverance from unforgiveness. 
Some of you need to be healed of depression. Some of you have low self-esteem and you, you're easily offended because of how you think of yourself. And God needs to deliver you from that. He doesn't want your flaws to be something that the devil can use as a weakness to keep you back. So we're sitting here and the altar is open. Now y'all know I'm a preacher that does things different. I do what God tells me. I don't want you to come and stand at the altar today. If you need to be at this altar this morning, I want you to come and sit right on this step right beside us while we sit here today recognize the flaws we have but understanding we're forgiven you got a thorn in your flesh you just wish God would take it but he hadn't taken it yet 